welcome back to another episode. And I am delighted to have a very special guest, Tamla Floyd, who, um, for many of you, sit down. Tamla is an IFS trainer. And while I have uh, tried to uh, use every technique that I know of to get trainers to open up a training for uh, financial therapists, nope, <laughs> it, it doesn't work. But um, why, why I've uh, asked Tamla to be on the podcast today is she's doing something that is, um, I think, I, I would guess maybe 75% of my financial planning clients, it's their number one goal. And I just thought it'd be super interesting to talk to her about her current lifestyle and how she's made that happen. So welcome, Tamala. Thank you. I'm glad to be here with you, Rick. Um, full disclosure, Tamala used to be my supervisor in IFS. Yeah. So to, to, for all the good things that I do, she is uh, one of the contributors. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you so much. Well, you are a wealth of knowledge, obviously. It, uh, becoming an IFS uh, a lead trainer doesn't happen easily, does it? No, it does not. It's been a five-year journey. Yes. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons they're so backed up, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You just can't flip a switch and add more uh, lead trainers tomorrow. No, not at all. So... When when we last talked, you were uh, going to be taking, I think at that time, somewhat of a shorter break to yes. go traveling. Exactly. Yeah. I'm just so curious about how that came about and what went into to preparing for that. Yeah. So funny thing, this actually came about when my husband and I were on vacation we were sitting on a beach in Aruba, and he just said, what if we could do this all the time? This was maybe eight years ago. What if we could do this all the time, just travel, um, live on the beach? And so our first idea was to move to Costa Rica and um, buy something on the beach or you know, rent initially until we decided where we wanted to live. But basically, to move to Costa Rica, we could have beachfront property for a lot cheaper than we could in the US. And um, so that was that was the goal. But then as COVID happened and we were, you know, hunkered down and in our home, we decided over time, what if we could travel full time? How could we make that happen? And the goal was always, even when it was Costa Rica, it was to move in 2020. But then when COVID happened and we couldn't sell the house and we had to stay put, we started considering other things. And so that's really how it started as a dream and then kind of morphed with what was happening with COVID. Um, and we decided we did, didn't want to go to Costa Rica. Costa Rica was one of the countries that stayed closed for a long time. Oh long time and the area of costa rica we were considering took a hard hit pretty much every restaurant we would have gone to uh, places of entertainment um did not come back after COVID. really so that, wow. that also contributed yes yes to us changing the plan so uh what what you have made happen i mean how long have you been traveling now year so year and a half it's been we left in june of 2022 so a little over a okay year now. just mm -hmm. over a year yeah so i mean i think uh, as people listen to this they're thinking wow <laughs> that, that's a dream how could how can i possibly make that happen um uh, i think um well just both from the emotional standpoint of of being out of the the us but also from a financial standpoint yeah yeah so for the emotional standpoint because it was something we both really wanted to do there was lots of excitement 
behind making this move. There was a lot of work to making it happen too, because as I said, we had a home to sell and we had, you know, we had to get our children situated. We had two children that were college age. Um, so, you know, all dealing with family stuff and everybody else getting on board with the fact that we were going to be traveling full time. Um, but for us, it was really about excitement and then a lot of hard work in order to make it happen between 2020 and 2022 when we actually left. Um, financially, what we decided is we just basically really simple for us. We basically added up what it was that we were spending a month to have a house, to have cars, insurance, uh, upkeep. Um, and we lived on a 10 acre property with horses. And so upkeep was a lot. Um, but we used that number as our budget for traveling. So what so so we were not spending more money living this lifestyle than we did living the lifestyle we had before. Um, and all of our children are grown, so we actually are more liquid now <laughs> than we were <laughs> right? when we were kids, right? So um, so yeah, so for us that that's what we decided that we did not want our monthly overhead to be any more than what it was when we were living in the States. So did you sell your property? We did. We okay. Did. Yeah. Yeah. So that eliminated a lot of, of the overhead, the property taxes, the upkeep Absolutely. on the place, things Absolutely. of that type. Yeah. What other expenses were included in that um, monthly spending amount? that you don't have anymore outside of the home and, and upkeep there? Do you sell cars? Cars, we sold all our cars. So we don't have car upkeep or auto insurance, car notes, you know, things like that. Um, utilities, we don't right. have utilities. Yeah. We don't have any internet um, because we live in Airbnbs every place we travel. Um, we've done a few hotels, but for the most part, I mean, hotels, I probably could count on one hand the times in the last year that we stayed at a hotel, but primarily okay. Airbnbs. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That, so that's, uh, that's fascinating. Yeah. Because it's, um, it's not requiring you more money to do this. No. It's requiring the same amount. Less. <laughs> depending yeah. on the country you travel to. <laughs> yes, tell that's another question I had was well what's the what's the lifestyle like? What what how far or <laughs> what's the shortage in the the money that you're spending, the money that provided for your lifestyle here? What's it like traveling around? You know <laughs> Wow, I had some emotion come up around what's it like. It's exciting. It's freeing. It's, you know, it's it's that dream come true experience. You know, it's something that for seven years we wanted to have it happen and to actually be living this life that you were dreaming and putting together and doing all the steps to make it happen. Um, so on, on some levels, it feels miraculous that we're here. And other levels, it's just like, yeah, but you you did what it took to get here, you know? So we're just really enjoying um, the lifestyle and just all of the experiences, the different people we meet, um, the food, the culture, uh, the life experiences, um, the differences and the sameness between us and people from all over the world. So it, it, it really is uh, feeling like, yeah, this is a dream come true. It's something that we dreamt about for a number of years. So tell me about the steps that it mm -hmm. took you to get there. Because you, you would mention yeah. a lot of hard work. Yeah, yeah. What, what comes to mind is what was that hard work? The downsizing, the letting go of everything, you know, the home, the last home that we owned, we were in that home for 15 years. It is truly the house we raised our children in. 
Um, so just, you know, I mean, we had animals that we had to sell, our horses, um, our dogs that we had to rehome. Um, you know, so there was just a lot of attack, you know, all the stuff that you do yeah. not take with you that you need. And then determining what are the things you will hold on to and where will that stuff be? Um, you know, both my husband and I both um, are self-employed on our own businesses. So, you know, keeping 10 years worth of tax records, where are they going to be? You know, um, so the things, you know, jewelry that I wasn't going to travel with, um, you know, so just making the decision about what to keep and what to let go of. So once the house was sold, we moved into an apartment. We downsized to a one bedroom apartment for that last year. We decided, you know, there was still once the house was sold, there's sold, there still was a lot of things to do. So we sold, we, I'm sorry, we moved into a one bedroom apartment. So that was a huge downsize. And then we still had to downsize even more when it was time to actually move. So, and what, what was the, that next downsizing? That was the, everything's gone. You know, when you just literally, we packed up, <laughs> we packed up the whole apartment. We called a thrift store and said, will you do a, a whole home pickup? And they said, yeah, we don't get those often, but yeah. So literally, we they came and they took couches and beds and TVs and computers we didn't want, pictures off the wall, silverware, you name it, they took it. Um, so one of the things I say is that was the easiest move I've ever done in my whole life. <laughs> <laughs> Ever. Just, Just pick come up the pick phone, it up. Come get it all. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. 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 And uh, I, I'm guessing, Tamla, I'm not sure, but so many people just would not consider going through this. And again, you were so intentional about this. Um. That uh, that's um, I mean you talk about attachment to our stuff. Yeah, it sounds like you really moved through that. Yeah. Oh, you just hit on a topic. Let me let's take the story back a little bit. To okay. 2016. When you talk about attachment to stuff, back in 26 2015 is when we made the started, not made the decision, but started talking about the possibility of living someplace else, okay? That, that's when the Aruba Beach thing happened. 2016, we were living in the state of Louisiana and we experienced 25 inches of rain overnight. Where we live flooded. My family had to be rescued by uh, fishery and wildlife or wildlife and fishery um, by boat from our home. Water did not receive for, from our home for seven days. We lost 95% of everything we owned. Wow. Our house took on three feet of water. So when you talk about attachments and stuff, that's when I had the hardest time <sighs> with all the stuff lost, three cars lost, everything in the home lost, only thing that was salvageable was the home itself. <laughs> um, and it took us uh, nine months, uh, nine, over nine months to get back in the home, but it took three years for the home to be completely repaired. Um, mm -hmm. So that's how we, that, that's how the attachment or lack thereof occurred with the stuff. And one of the things my husband and I said, because we already knew we wanted to move, right? And, and live someplace else, at least, Costa Rica at the time. My husband said to me, we will never own as much stuff as we did ever again in life. And that was true. Because when we replace things, knowing that the goal was to move, we only replaced what was absolutely necessary. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, the children needed beds and we needed a nice. bed and we needed living room furniture, a dining room table to eat. But, you know, we had two dining room spaces. We only put a table in one of the dining spaces, you know, so things that we 
had, we had a whole, you know, playroom in the back of the house with the kids. Well, all of the hockey tables and you know, all the stuff that was back in that room, all of that didn't get replaced again. We only bought what was absolutely necessary. Um, so it was significantly less than what we had um, before. We lost three cards, we replaced it with two cards. So, you know, so every, we were all, so downsizing actually happened in one event for us. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That is pretty powerful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. Yeah, it is. I mean, it, 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 it was a, it was a forced downsizing. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. <laughs> you yes. Lost ninety five percent of your stuff, and at the same time, you you had that intentionality yeah. that you were going to do this. Yeah. Still. Yes. Oh man, yeah. that yeah. is amazing. Thank you, Rick. It oh. really is. You know, when I look back on it, it, it really is amazing. I mean, and the ways in which. You know, this is an aside, but I just have to say it because it was so significant and it, 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 it did impact us financially. The ways in which community, you know, I was a psychotherapist in a very small town. Everybody knew me, a town of 10,000 people. Um, so, you know, everybody knew me. So the way in which the community rallied around us, most of the things we replaced were given to us, bought for us. one person at church said, go to the neighborhood furniture store, buy whatever you need, we'll pick up the bill. I mean, so wow. the two cars that were replaced were donated to us. Someone just gave us two cars. My husband was is the only tech company in town. So both of us were well known in, in this community. And man, when I tell you that his clients and folks who knew me just, I mean, they came out of the woodwork in order to help us you know, get our life back together. The community, wow. 30 people came out and helped get all that icky, yucky, stinky stuff <laughs> out of our house that sat in water for seven days, you know? Yeah, yeah. So wow. that also was a financial, you know, and I can't even speak of all the gift cards and checks and cash and that, you know, that's just uh, yeah, on top of everything else. So, wow. Yeah, so that also helped us financially. Um, the way that the community showed up. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And then when you said the stinky stuff in the house, I immediately went back to a flood we had in our town in 1972, and uh -huh. it killed 238 people. Oh my goodness. And the, um, I shoveled mud. I was a teenager then for mm -hmm. the whole summer. It happened in June. And did it stink? There is nothing like the smell of rotting mud. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. Oh. Yeah. So Absolutely. I get it. When you say stinky stuff. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I it, get that. It, horrible. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. What a story. It is a story. I always say I need to write a book about it. <laughs> I guess you could. And maybe there's a book in this whole thing. You know, how to do it. Although probably you wouldn't prescribe, well, pray for a natural disaster. <laughs> I would not. Wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy ever. It was, uh, yeah, it was horrific. It really, really was. Yeah. But that adds so much light to why this process, the downsizing that happened when you sold your house and the one bedroom yeah. and things. Yeah. The, these were not necessarily heirlooms or things that have been in the family forever and ever and I ever. Lost that stuff. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um. Geez, so many, so many ways to go. Um. But I, I can imagine just the what the 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 um the difficult emotions that would come up. In losing all that stuff, I mean, yeah. what 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 did you learn through that experience, or or as you look back on it, what? I mean, you had no choice but to go through it. Yeah. But uh, what what's the what are the learnings that came out of that for you? <laughs> sometimes the, the biggest learning for me was sometimes the helper 
needs help. Uh, I was a helper in the community. Oh, yes. You know? And that was hard for me. Yes. You know, I to tell, don't know. You know, we want to buy your family, you know, mattresses. No, we, we've, we've got money. We can. But who has to replace every single thing they own all yes. at once? Let yes. us help you. And I was like, uh, uh, you know, it was it was hard. It was hard. I had been also prior to opening my private practice as a psychotherapist. I was also the uh, social worker, medical social worker at our community hospital. And literally, uh, they took up, you know, uh, 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 what I want to say. Um, word just escaped me, but, you know, when they collect money, took up a collection, um, you know, from the doctors and, you know, the nurses, the people who knew me from working in the hospital, they came to my house on the day of all that the cleanup was happening. And they said, we, we need to take you somewhere. We want, uh, we, we need to take you somewhere. And I was like, okay, uh, what, what are we doing? They said, it, it's a surprise. They took me to the hospital and the doctors and nurses were lined up like a receiving line. And they just had me go by each person and each person handed me an envelope. I, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Wow. Yeah. And it so brings I, up I, emotion I, in both of yes, us. <laughs> yes. Just, you know, accepting help. Yes. Take the way. Is that, you know, when you give and give and give, <laughs> Your value in the community, you fall on hard times. Yeah. I had to learn to allow people to share their blessings with me. Wow. Because that's what they were doing. Yes. Blessings with my family. And who am I to deny them what it feels like to give? Yes. Oh, eventually. So that was that was my biggest. It wasn't about the stuff. It wasn't. The other thing that I can say, though, is that I also my biggest takeaway was that another huge takeaway was that the only thing that mattered when the fire department and you know wildlife or whatever was trying to figure out how to get us out of our home because at first they couldn't figure out how they were going to rescue us the only thing that mattered in that moment was my husband my daughter and my son and myself getting out safely i could care less about what stuff we were going to lose yeah wow yeah, and to think that the way they had to get us out was by boat. I mean, that you've got so much water on your property that yeah. nobody can walk in and you can't walk out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so those were the biggest learnings, um, that stuff can be replaced. Yes, yes. Wow. Yeah. Um, what, what, one thing you said that was so powerful, and it... It, I was I first ran into the idea th- uh, in uh, training in nonviolent communication. Okay. And that was if I don't receive a gift from somebody, mm-hmm. I am um, taking away the joy yeah. of giving that is so inherent in most people yes it's yeah. a, it is a blessing it, when, when a person wants to give that is typically coming from a, a very generous place and a, yes. a, and a wanting to share and to say no to that yeah it's almost spirit crushing. Yes, to the giver. exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And it doesn't surprise me that you had that deep knowledge <laughs> of saying, well, heck, I am blessing them. Yes. In yes. their act of blessing to me. Absolutely. Absolutely. Wow. Yes. Oh, that is yes. so powerful. Yes. <sighs> and although I never said no to anyone 
it took me some time to be okay with receiving the gift. Yes. That was my growth, is that just being okay with receiving the gift, you know, that, um, yeah, yeah. I'm going to- We had an, a, a, a situation that happened. <laughs> we, we had, you know, we volunteered at churches in our community with just various things that needed to happen within the community. And so one of the churches that we volunteered at, it wasn't a, a church we belonged to, but we yeah, volunteered for various different things at this church. And so we go in um, when they're feeding people, you know, we weren't the only family affected in our community. So they had set up a soup kitchen and free meals and food to take away if you needed it. And so they saw me and my husband, hey, Tamlin, Ernest, come on into the kitchen, grab an apron, da 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 because they thought we were there to help. And we said, no, we're here to get food. We lost everything, wow. you know? So it was just, again, the humility that comes yeah. with such a great loss. Wow. Yeah. I'm guessing there's a few parts of yourself that you needed to work with around that. Oh, M G. <laughs> Can we number them? <laughs> so side note, me and my whole family went to therapy because one of the things that I know as a trauma therapist is that it's what happens immediately after the traumatic event that decreases the likelihood that this will be synthesized as a lifetime trauma. So I knew we needed to get some help. This was my daughter's senior year of high school. She'd lost everything. And the time that this happened was a couple of weeks before her prom. She lost her dress, she lost her cap and gown we'd already bought. She lost, you know, so all of the stuff connected for her with high, you know, high school graduation. Um, my son was extremely depressed as a result of losing everything. So it was clear to me as a psychotherapist, we need to get in therapy immediately, which is exactly what, what we did. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Tamala, uh, we could talk for another two hours. We could. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we're going to have to leave it there because we're out of time. Yes. So you know it, interesting enough, the one thing that I didn't say that is a financial piece, do I have time to say this? Yeah, quickly? sure. The last thing is that if we spend 330 days outside of the U.S., we pay no federal taxes. 330 days outside of the U.S., we pay no federal taxes. Wow. Now, it may be because of the way things are, we've set things up financially. So that's one of the things I absolutely wanted to leave with your listeners to check with their tax advisors. Wow. Around. And we decided to domicile in the state of Florida, which also means we pay no state taxes living this You way. could have domiciled in South Dakota and gotten that yeah, accomplished too. That too. That too. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that is so good. Yeah, yeah. Well, Tamla, thank you so much you for taking so the time welcome. to to be with us. And I know that uh, my listeners are going to really have enjoyed this. Awesome. Thank you for having me, Rick. Thank you.